we have a great show for you tonight. We have a fantastic show. Very funny comedians. I know funny. I do very funny. People always ask me who I think is funny. That's the number two question I get asked as a comedian. The number one question I get asked as a comedian is, have you ever died? As soon as, someone, as, soon as you tell someone you're a comedian, first thing they want to know, oh, have you ever died? Oh, what's it like when no one laughs? Oh, tell us, what's the wor tell us about the worst gig you've ever had in your life. Please, relive for me, in minute detail, the worst moment of your professional career. <laughs> have you ever really died? It's like saying to a doctor, tell us about the last patient you lost. What happened? <laughs> With the family crying, I bet they were, were they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People are such ghouls. It's the number one question, have you ever died? Number two question, though, is what makes you laugh? People always want to know that from me. Who do you think is funny? And that's a nicer question, that's more understandable. You know, I make people laugh, people want to know what makes me laugh. In the same way as you might say to your hairdresser, who cuts your hair? Or you might say to someone in an Audi, who do you think drives like a cock? Same thing. <laughs> I like that joke, it's a short joke, it's a sharp joke, and also with that joke, I get to spot every Audi driver in the room. I can just see that <laughs> pinched expression on your face there. All right, no need to be like that about it. I've done well for myself, it's a very reliable machine. And the fact that I can tell you're an Audi driver by the expression on your face means technically you've just given a form of indication. So well done. Good for you. <laughs> we knew you could do it. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever died? Who do you think is funny? You always get asked the same questions. That's what, I don't like doing interviews. I love doing the job. This is great. I love standing here talking to you, though. But doing interviews, is, it's a necessary evil. It's part of the job. I have to answer questions. And I don't like, I don't even like watching interviews. You'd rather watch a comedian tell jokes than talk about how they wrote them. You'd rather watch a singer sing songs than talk about their inspiration. You'd rather watch a sports person do their sport. You'd certainly rather watch a sports person do their sport. Come on now. <laughs> sports interviews can be turgid affairs at best. And then I hit it with my foot. You mean you kicked it? If you like. <laughs> They're very really interesting. They're really, and I'm not slagging sports people. It takes a great deal of single-mindedness to excel at a sport to a point where people want to interview you about it. But sports people are famous because they're good at sport, not because they're good at talking about sport. <laughs> That's why you find a sports person who is good at talking about sport, the BBC will cream their knickers over them. <laughs> We found a woman, she used to ride horses, that's a sport, and she's quite lively and engaging and charismatic. Put her on absolutely everything! <laughs> Do not let her out of your sight! Even people I'm a fan of, Andy Murray. I love Andy Murray. Britain should be very proud of Andy Murray. He's done a lot to be proud of. He's won Wimbledon, he's an Olympic gold medalist, and he put up with a lot of shit when he was doing, what, eighth best in the world? Oh, you bloody loser, you. Yeah. <laughs> done a lot to be proud of. He's won Wimbledon, he's Olympic gold medals, he's, and he's magnanimous in victory, he's humble in defeat. He's, 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 and he's a big comedy fan. He's been to see me live, I've met him, lovely bloke. But Jesus Christ. <laughs> I have not listened to him drone on one more time about how he won, stroke, lost another tennis match. I can't do it. <laughs> well, then I hit it to him, and he hit it back to me. And <laughs> I'm very good at tennis, but he is also very good at tennis. <laughs> Some days I'm better at tennis than he is, but I think what's happened today was he was slightly better at tennis than I am, and that's maybe <laughs> why he won the game of the tennis. Oh, for God's sake, man! <laughs> I'm not very sporty, you can probably tell. I like, I like hill walking, it doesn't really count as a sport. I like hill walking and camping. Proper camping, though. None of your glamping bullshit. <laughs> glamping. Derivation of the words glamorous and camping. Where you stay in a yurt, which is more expensive than a hotel. What is wrong with you? A lot of people don't realise yurt is a derivation of the words yura and twat. A lot of people don't realise that. <laughs> Do you love London? <laughs> I love London. I feel like London is created by the people, right? Who are just crazy and sexy and ambitious. I got into an Uber the other day, not bragging, and um, <laughs> I got into an Uber and the driver, he said, um, would you like to have the radio on? And I was like, oh, um, I don't mind, it's up to you. And then he said, um, well, actually, um, I make my own music. <laughs> Do you mind if I put some of that on? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> and then he put on Drake's new album. <laughs> I wonder how often it works. I wonder, I wonder how often there's a middle-aged white woman thinking, oh, well, he looks like Aladdin and he sounds like confidence personified. <laughs> Pull over and jump in the back, Nikolai. <laughs> I, love it. 
I am, I'm having a good life. I have recently started doing yoga, which has just changed. Yes, woo for the yoga over there. Are you um, a team? Uh, come to... <laughs> I'm new to it, I'm new to it. I love it, yoga has changed my life. It's brilliant, yoga is my new drug. Um, my old drug was drugs. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything positive about because it would be incredibly irresponsible. I'm not going to say anything positive about drug taking. What I will say is um, I didn't take MDMA until I was 32 and it was such a relief to know I could be happy. <laughs> I'm just the broken. But yoga is nearly as good and there's no downsides. It's given me a whole new language. My favourite new word is namaste. Yeah, it's a very old word, it's very sacred, and it means the yoga has finished now. <laughs> and then you're allowed to leave. I think that the key to being happy as you get older is self-acceptance. Like, I have to accept things about myself now, like, I'm 36, I thought I would have children by now, and I don't. In an ideal world, what I wanted, I wanted to self-fertilise. I wanted to have children that were exactly my genetics, so that I could show them to my parents and go, see, it was my childhood, they're fine. <laughs> Science can't do that yet. And then I had a crazy day last month where I just thought, I'm just going to buy some sperm. I'm just going to buy some sperm off the internet. I've got a good job. I'm just going to buy some sperm. Guys, sperm is so much more expensive than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Tens of thousands of pounds. We are all wasting a valuable resource. <laughs> Seventeen-year-old me would have been a millionaire if I'd learned how to catch it and chuck it in the freezer. <laughs> so it's a shock. I am, um, and I, I do think self-acceptance is the key. Like, there's things about myself I don't like, but I just have to accept now that they're not going to change. This is who I am. Like, so for instance, um, I don't like art. <laughs> I think art is rubbish. <laughs> I think lots of people think art is rubbish, but we're too worried of looking stupid, so we go along with it. Um, I think that the worst art form is theatre. And, well, OK, I can sense how unpopular this opinion is. <laughs> I think theatre is diabolical. Uh, look, I do, look, and also, I'm aware, if you are a performer of some kind, if you're an actor, look, please don't be offended. I don't mean being in the play. Obviously, if you're the person in the play that gets to put a wig on and walk up and down and move your arms and project your voice, saying things like, um, I think you'll find you're contradicting yourself, Alan. Fun. <laughs> Having to watch it. <laughs> Dear Christ. I can't concentrate, I can't lose myself in the story. I know that it's not real because I'm surrounded by people eating crisps. <laughs> and, and they don't let you look at your phone. So all you're thinking is, well, how long has it been? This year, I did no lilt February. Thank you. <laughs> I know it sounds impossible, but you take it one day at a time. Did I have any today? No, you're a legend. <laughs> It gets hard around the middle of the month, you get the cravings. It's called lilt guilt. You're like, oh, I bloody love the lilt. <laughs> it's the night where you go to the shop at midnight, you kick the doors in, where's the lilt? And they're like, we don't stock it anymore. Like, ah! Oh! So you try and make your own hooch lilt. You know, you get a pineapple and a grapefruit, and you add in batteries and a horse's head, and you're like, <laughs> it's good, but it's not totally tropical. <laughs> Did that joke in America recently? Turns out they don't have lilt there. This is it. This is all I do. Imagine if this was your actual... This is... I go like, blah, 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 and you go, ah, ha, 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 money. <laughs> Can't believe I get away with it. You do actual, proper London jobs. You know, like, like blacksmith, you know? <laughs> Farrier. <laughs> Brunch DJ. The big three. <laughs> I tell you, I do not trust. People who work in offices, I know, right? What are they doing? Nothing takes that long. They're planning something. They must be. <laughs> Do you know what you know? Do you ever call in to visit your friend in an office unexpectedly? Everyone just shits themselves. They're like, what's he doing here? <laughs> lie, cover the screen, lie across the spreadsheet, get him out. Kind regards, warm regards, best, best. That's how they talk. <laughs> See the email. I know what it's like in the real world. Look, sometimes I check in your world. Oh, gross, back to showbiz. And... <laughs> no, 
I'm very self-aware of the level of fame that I have. I was in a supermarket recently and an older lady came up to me and she put her hands on my shoulders and she said, you are vaguely familiar. And that is it. <laughs> Wrexham, and I was at an ATM machine, and a guy cycled by and he shouted at me, Surprised to see you at an ATM machine! And I've been obsessed with it since then. What did he mean? <laughs> like, on the one hand, is he surprised I don't have a butler to go to the ATM machine for? No, I think it's the opposite. I think I'm surprised you have any money whatsoever to <laughs> keyboard horse shit. <laughs> Here's my, uh, my greatest ever showbiz tale. I did a gig in your Milton Keynes recently, thank you, and I was staying in the Milton Keynes Hilton, and she is the least well-known of all the Hilton sisters. <laughs> and I checked in after the gig at like half 12. Room 303 is where this took place. Uh, open the door, uh, TV on in the room. Not that uncommon in the chain hotels, I guess it's to welcome you, but get this, on the TV, is me playing the shitty keyboard on some show. Immediate thought is like, is this a service they provide to all guests? If so, we, no, it's the realization, this is it. I've arrived. And I waltz into the room, down the little corridor with the loo away to the left. And as the room opens out, there is a fully naked man lying on the bed. <laughs> They've given me the key to someone else's room. But he is lying there, watching me <laughs> on the TV. And he looks up. <laughs> and he sees me. I wish I'd had the wit to think of something smart. What I say is like, oh, shit, sorry, man. <laughs> and I'd be a legend. I could have been like, oh, are you enjoying this? Ah, no boner. And just walked out of it. It's lovely to be here. I've come all the way from Brighton. <laughs> just in case you're wondering what this haircut is about. Um, <laughs> might be a new face uh, for some of you people. Um, don't panic. The BBC invited me here because they, they needed a beige lesbian. So <laughs> I'm just here to tick some boxes. Not your box, madam, just, um, <laughs> just a metaphorical box. <laughs> I'm half Spanish, that's what's happening there. <laughs> I've got a Spanish mum, and uh, she lives here in the UK. It's all very legal. <laughs> she's lived longer in the UK than she's ever lived in Spain, but the brilliant thing about my mum is that she's never lost her accent. She talks very, very quickly, she talks very, lost her words she cannot pronounce. Lost and lost her words she cannot pronounce, huh? My favourite word that my mum's never been able to pronounce is, uh, my brother's name. <laughs> it's not even a difficult name, his name's Stephen. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this, but Spanish people, any word that begins with the letter S, they struggle, right? So my mum doesn't call him Stephen, she calls him... Estiven. <laughs> is it? <laughs> Isn't it just Stephen? <laughs> and if I know his name is my son, it is Stephen! <laughs> you don't want to mess with my mum. She's not like British people here in this country. We can be quite passive aggressive, can't we? <laughs> She's just a very aggressive woman. <laughs> My mum's never really coped in this country, and I think it's because, like a lot of Mediterranean people, she's quite loud, yeah? She's got one volume, it's like this. Hello! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Whereas in this country, particularly if we're middle class, we tend to be low talkers, don't we? We don't like to raise our voices, do we? just assume that if you are raising your voice, well, you're probably poor. <laughs> or worse, foreign. <laughs> Great thing about having a Mediterranean mum is they feed you. Oh, my God. She's always feeding. That's her way of showing that she loves her children, is to feed us. You know, I can remember going around friends' houses, you know, like English mums. Go around a, an English mum's house and the conversation with mum's more like this. I think you've had enough. 
My mum will feed you till you puke. <laughs> Anything could be going on in my life and my mum will relate it back to a meal that she's cooked. Do you know what I mean? Like, so good or bad, particularly if I'm depressed. If I phone up my mum and I've had a terrible day, yeah? I phone up my mum, conversation always goes like this. Oh, Jennifer, my God, I'm so sorry to hear that you're having a hard time right now. But you know what? Don't worry, OK? I made a soup. <laughs> Come on, you sound hungry. I made a chicken curry, I made a lamb tagine, I made a casserole, Jennifer, I made some tortillas, some paella, some curry, Jennifer, you love curry, maybe some meatballs, some pork ball, beef ball, and a seed ball, banana ball. You're a lesbian, you don't eat enough balls, please. <laughs> Come on. Eat my balls. I've made a list of pros and cons, because I've been spending a lot of time in brothels and prisons. <laughs> Made a list of pros and cons, always good, give you a bit of balance, give you a bit of balance. Con, complete loss of all feelings of hope and possibility. Hmm, oh, that doesn't sound very good, does it? It doesn't sound much fun, does it? Pro, increased plug socket access. <laughs> Bam, one all! <laughs> I, I, I say increased, uh, it's actually total plug socket access. Um, I've got 32 plug sockets in my house, each and every one of them is now under my sole domain. <laughs> Uh, con, all experiences that formed the basis of my happiness and sense of self-worth are now destroyed by grief. <laughs> downer! <laughs> a bit of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> Pro, less recycling. Yeah. <laughs> I can fit it all in the green box now. It's remarkable when you take into account just how much I'm drinking. <laughs> oh, John, you're meant to heat mulled wine. All right, your highness, hand me the bottle and leave. Uh, con, con, I'm gonna lose me else. <laughs> bit of fun, bit of fun, bit of fun. <laughs> Pro, 25% off council tax. <laughs> I was on that like a ferret. <laughs> Dialing as the door slammed. <laughs> uh, and that's us fresh out of cons. The rest are just pros, guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Increased freezer space, all four drawers. <laughs> Cheaper gas and electric. Reduced wear and tear on fixtures and fittings. <laughs> and, and when I say reduced, I don't mean by half, because I was only ever responsible for about 10% of scuffs and spills. <laughs> so we're looking at a net reduction of 90% in real terms. <laughs> uh, this is my favourite one, my favourite one. Ultimate control over where the iPhone charger cable is and why it is there. There was a time it would take hours to answer the questions, where is the iPhone charger cable and why is it there? <laughs> Not anymore. Plugged in next to the bed, most convenient place to have it. <laughs> Simple. Is it... Is it unplugged in the bathroom? No, no, it's not. Be a ludicrous place to keep it, there's no plug socket in the bathroom. <laughs> Is it? Is it in the front pocket of a rucksack you no longer use? <laughs> That'll be the last place you look. That'll be very frustrating. Is it? Is it plugged in on a train we have alighted from? <laughs> no, no. It's plugged in next to the bed because that's the most convenient place to have it. <laughs> <laughs>